Turn to Judges chapter 16, if you would, please. <clears throat> we welcome everyone that's joining us virtually as we look into the Word and as we take requests for prayer and later go to prayer. Trust the Lord will be with us. I'm going to break into the narrative here and just read verses, um, beginning at verse 16, we'll read down through verse 21. <clears throat> it came to pass when she pressed him, when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart, and of course this is Samson spilling his guts, if you will, telling his secret to this wicked woman. There hath not come, he said, he told her all of his heart, said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been an Azrite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he hath showed me all of his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her, brought money in their hand, and she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself, and he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him, put out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza, bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. <clears throat> Let's pray once more. Father, we thank you for bringing us together this evening. Thankful for each one who's here. And we pray, Father, that you would bless us through the study of your word. Heavenly Father, may we learn what we need to learn from this passage and others related to it in this portion of Scripture regarding this amazing and unusual man. Truly a riddle himself. The riddle maker was quite an enigma. And we're not capable of figuring him out but Lord, we can learn from him and from his experiences. And Lord, we pray that our lessons would be positive as well as negative, what we are to do as well as what we're not to do. And Lord, how we might have power and the dangers of losing power with God and thus power with men. Now we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless your word to us, give us the Holy Spirit, that he would enable us to bring the message properly and as he would have it brought and to hear it for our soul's good. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless us now as we uh, proceed, that you might be glorified in this service and that you would be with us and uh, bind Satan and prevent him from hindering us even either in the studying of the word or in prayer. We know that he delights to pluck up the seed. He delights to bring uh, anything that would disturb. And uh, we ask, Lord, that you would prevent him. And we ask, Lord, that you would teach us from the scriptures and that we, it would be to our prophet. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Samson is clearly one of the most remarkable men 
of whom we read in the scriptures, and in some respects, perhaps the most remarkable. Of course, we exclude the Lord Jesus Christ who is truly for every good reason, the most remarkable man, the God-man. But there were other men in scripture that were quite noteworthy as well. And when we say that, that Samson was one of the most remarkable men recorded in scripture of whom we have record in scripture, that is to say that he is among the most extraordinary men of the whole world of all time. Uh, for example, who among all of mankind could rival, say, a Noah or an Abraham or a Moses or a Joshua, a David, a Solomon, Daniel? Of course, the list passes over many other <clears throat> great names that could be mentioned and of course you're aware of them as well as I am. But he was one of very few men of whose birth his parents received uh, notification from heaven uh, concerning not only his birth but his conception. Uh, that he that the mother would conceive and this was known to them beforehand uh, of course again accepting the Lord Jesus Christ we see that his birth was certainly announced beforehand from angels the angels of glory but there was Isaac in the Old Testament uh, his birth was conception and birth was announced to Abraham and Sarah by angels. John the Baptist in the New Testament, his birth, conception and birth was made known to Zacharias and Elizabeth by angels from heaven, the angel Gabriel, I believe in that case. And all three of these cases, the mother had been barren. Manoah's wife was barren. We don't know her age, but we assume that she was getting along in years as well. We know that Sarah was 90 years old and barren, had never had children. Elizabeth was way up in years and she was barren. So in two cases, it was made known to the parents beforehand that the child was a Nazarite and that he would be forbidden. He would be denied certain foods, wine, strong drink, anything of the vine. Uh, we don't know what all the diet consisted of, but it was a special diet that was designated uh, by the Lord, by the angel that announced the conception and birth to come. Uh, what the, And in this case, what the mother was to eat after conception and prior to the, the birth of the child. In chapter 13, in verses 4 and 5, we read there, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing anything of the ceremonial law that was unclean, she was not to eat it. So obviously <clears throat> these things were not for sake of her health or the health of the child, uh, because we know later that many of those things that were unclean were declared to be clean and you could eat them. It wasn't a matter that they were gonna hurt, harm you as far as your physical health was concerned. It was a matter that they were declared unclean for various reasons according to the ceremonial law. And so their consecration to the Lord depended upon their following a certain diet. Well, this was even more strict when it came to the Nazarite consecration and the Nazarite vow. So he was a holy, a man that was wholly dedicated to the Lord. John the Baptist was the other. Uh, these that had their conception and birth announced to their parents, who's their mother barren, uh, 
Samson and John the Baptist were Nazarites. But his consecration was from the moment of his conception, as we see, from the moment that he became a viable human being. That's the debate with the uh, abortionist <clears throat> and the pro-life people. That's the debate that has been going on for uh, ever since uh, Roe, Roe v. Wade and before. When does life begin? Is it when the baby can feel pain or is it at 24 weeks or when is it? That's when the argument is. And of course, we <clears throat> as Bible believers have always contended, contended that it begins, life begins at birth. That is a viable human being from the moment of conception. I didn't mean birth, I mean conception. Clearly that was the case here. From the moment of conception, he was to receive nothing that was forbidden a Nazarite, either through the umbilical cord from his mother while he was in the womb, or directly by mouth after he was born, after he came into this world. He was to receive nothing that was forbidden. The Nazarite, as far as his consecration, was concerned. He was raised up, Samson was, he was raised up of God to be a deliverer. And he would begin to deliver. We see from the very outset that this one would begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. He was quite a remarkable judge. He would do his work. <clears throat> his work of deliverance would be done in quite a remarkable, spectacular way, uh, grander style than any of the other judges before him, as remarkable as some of them were, Gideon, for example, but what Samson is going to do is going to be astounding. And we have to wonder what he might have accomplished, what he might have done, had it not been for his sin and for his sacrificing the great power that he had uh, to his uh, sinfulness and his sinful be behavior. But this amazing man, this amazing human being, was especially endowed with superhuman strength, which was marvelously displayed on many occasions, uh, including the occasion of his death, which was the grandest display of his power in all of his life, was saved to the very end, when as he would die, he would also take more Philistines with him in his death than he had slain in all of his life before. And that's saying, <clears throat> that's saying a great deal. But I want us to consider some things tonight about Samson and <clears throat> about his amazing strength, not simply for sake of marveling at it, which we certainly do that, but to learn what God can still do through earthen vessels, through consecrated earthen vessels, because I believe that is one of the main reasons why we have the example of Samson in the scripture. Despite all of the ups and downs and the, the enigma that he was, he's a hard man to understand, he's a hard man to figure out. But nevertheless, his story is very instructive to us and can be very encouraging he instructs us by positive example and by negative example, and we need to learn from both of them. But first, I want us to consider the source of his strength and the condition for his receiving it. We know from reading these four chapters, chapters 13 through 16, we know from reading these chapters that the strength was not constant the supernatural strength that he displayed on so many occasions was not constant. Um, it came upon him. The, the strength came as he needed it. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, we read. 
This began early in his life. I mean, ju he was just born. And we, we read of him just that uh, the woman bare the son and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him, and the Spirit of the Lord began to move him in the times, in, at times in the camp of Dan between Zor and Eshtael. So the Spirit of the Lord began to move on him, and he showed signs of this great strength that he had, which was displayed in a physical way. But the source of his strength was not physical. The source was not. It was a spiritual strength that was given to him, displayed in his physical feats and the things that he was able to do. But the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he slew a lion with his bare hands. We see this in chapter 14. When Samson went down, his father and his mother, to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath, and behold, a young lion roared against him. Evidently, he was out ahead of his <coughs> parents, or they had gone before one. I believe he was ahead of them. <coughs> and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And we see here that a young lion roared against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid, as if that had been just a little lamb. He, he just absolutely destroyed that lion with his bare hands because the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Now, as he was walking along there, he was not experiencing that kind of physical strength. It was available to him, but he was not walking in that kind of strength that he could have just reached over and grabbed the tree and broken it in two. No, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him at that time when he needed that strength and he slew that lion. There's a great lesson to be learned in that, how that he later came back and got honey from the carcass of the lion. And we see a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ and his victory that he's won over that lion that roars against us and the honey but drips from his hands now that he dispenses in his grace as he uh, stands in the church. And we're recipients of that great victory. But here, Samson slew this lion with his bare hands. Another time we read, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he slew a thousand Philistines. This is recorded in chapter 15, verses 14 through 17. But he slew a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. First of all, he tore asunder the cords that they had him tied with. And then he slew a thousand of them. The first thing that he could find was this jawbone of an ass. He had no other weapon to use. Had he not found that, the Lord had a purpose for that, but he could have slain them like he did the lion with his bare hands had the Lord so pleased. But he showed him this weapon, this crude weapon, and he took it and slew a thousand Philistines. Our weapons of our warfare are spiritual weapons. They're not carnal weapons. <clears throat> but we see in that picture how unusual our weapons are and how lethal they are when the Lord empowers us to use those weapons uh, in our warfare. We read uh, in another place, that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And this is in chapter 16, the ch chapter where we've taken our text. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and uh, he had been captured. He was in Gaza. He was a prisoner. He had laid there all night. But when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, we see that he arose at midnight and took the doors of the gates of the city and the two posts, and went away with them, bars and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of the hill that is before Hebron. Now that is already uh, an amazing story. You can imagine what these gates weighed. Uh, we think of the gates of Babylon, those brass gates, and how massive they were and how heavy they were, and 
Not only that, he, he took them bars and all and ripped up the posts out of the ground and carried them on his shoulders. That's an impressive thing, but it becomes more impressive when we realize that the hill of Hebron was 40 miles from Gaza, and he carried the gates of the city. Again, a display of his power as the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. So his strength was owing to nothing in nature, but it was due solely to his consecration to God when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. His mother's instructions about her diet and his diet before he was even conceived, what her diet was to be while she carried him in her womb, what his diet was to consist of, what it was denied after his birth, it had, uh, her instruction was not to now eat plenty of protein, uh, avoid fatty foods, eat healthy. Now you got, you're going to, this, this son that you're going to bear is we're going to, he's going to begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines and you're, he's going to have to be really physically strong to do that. No, it had nothing to do with, uh, worth and had nothing to do with, uh, with those and sinew and, and tissues and muscle. That wasn't what it was about. It had only to do with his consecration and his spiritual strength. His consecration as an Azrite. That's all it had to do with. And of course, you know that refraining from the things that he refrained from, as we said earlier, would not have anything to do with how much physical strength he would naturally have. Now he had only, they had only to do with his consecration. That was his diet. Every child of God is to be consecrated. We are set apart by the Lord. That is a part of the Nazarite was set apart unto God. He was sanctified. He was consecrated unto the Lord. Well, so is every single child of God. We are to be set apart. We are to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And as such, believers can uh, exercise great strength as we are consecrated to the Lord. The believer is chosen of God, he's set apart, he's separated, each one is equipped for battle against a very strong enemy. This lion is one that we too must do battle with. The lions that we face are numerous. Many uh, battles have to be fought. And it's a battle from the day that we are born again until we get to heaven. We're told that in many places. We're, we're assigned armor to wear and we're not to lay it down. We're not to take it off until this life is finished and we go to be with the Lord. Then we can lay our armor aside. But we're called to be in warfare. We're battling the spiritual Philistines. We're battling the world. So each one is equipped for this strong enemy. The strength we need is not natural. It's physical. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't callings that require physical strength as well. When you consider going to Indonesia as a missionary and trekking the jungles and wading through the swamps and, and all of the effort that has to go into that, it requires some physical strength as well as spiritual. The Lord supplies that according to the calling. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance, and if that is the gift necessary to the calling, God will provide that. But we're talking about not natural strength, not physical strength. Uh, th we're talking about the what we need for this battle and for this warfare, which is spiritual. We're told that in 2 Corinthians, you remember, that uh, the, the weapons are, of our warfare are suited to the nature of the battle. They're not carnal. In other words, they're spiritual. They're not carnal, but they're mighty. They're mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. 
Satan's or Samson's unshorn head was a symbol of his inner strength, and his diet was a sign of his dedication, that sign of his consecration. The Holy Spirit within us is the secret strength of the believer. He is our strength. And his spiritual food is the word of God. That is the believer's spiritual food is the word of God. His consecration is prayer, his prayer life, his holy walk, his sanctification, his dedication, essential to, uh, to having power with God. Without these, we're not going to have power. And so the consecration of the Nazarite, I believe that it's emblematic. It, it pictures the consecration of the child of God and what it is, what food we eat, as it were, what we take in and what, we, what becomes a part of us to give us the kind of strength that we need for this battle, to access the, the strength of the Spirit of God who is in us and abides in us. It is prayer. It's the Word of God. These things are essential, our sanctification. We have power with God thereby, and we have power with men, as the songwriter said. Give us power, power with men and power with thee. By God's power, We can do all things. Paul said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Samson teaches us that we can do all things, the impossible, things that we would never be able to do, we're able to do. We're not talking about physical feats. We're talking about spiritual victories, talking about spreading the gospel, seeing souls saved, seeing Satan's strongholds pulled down. You don't do that with physical strength. You do that by the power of God. And how do we access the power of God? Through our consecration, through our dedication. We have access to God and his power. And that's what we, we need. So by God's power, we can do all things. We can rend the roaring lion that is always on the prowl. Unexpected places he shows up. We never know when his attack is going to come. Who would have ever thought that he would be found in a vineyard? Who would have thought a lion would come roaring out of a vineyard? That's the last thing you, place you'd expect a lion to be. And yet there he was. And he roared out against, uh, against Samson. And it's specific there. His parents were with him. Evidently, they weren't nearby because he didn't tell his parents what he had done. He didn't even tell them about slaying the lion, so they didn't know about it. But it came out against him. The lion first came out against our Savior, and thankfully, the Savior slew him. Now, we know that Satan is still on the loose. We know that he is restricted very much in what he's allowed to do. But he's already defeated. He, the Christ defeated him on the cross. But now we too are able to tread him under our feet. But he took him on first and he slew him. And now part of that honey that comes out of the carcass of that dead lion is the fact that we too can tread him under our feet. We too can have victory over him. We have the grace the strength through grace to be able to do that. So we have to rend the lion. Peter says he, he is, Satan is like a roaring lion. Uh, he goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I'm thankful that says may and not can. He has the power to do, to rend us, that's for sure, if God would allow it but he may not do it. But he still roars against us. He still does us all the harm that he can. He tries to do all the harm to the advancement of the kingdom that he can. 
He tries to interfere in every service we have. I'm convinced of that. He would love to be here and, and ruin our prayer meeting. Well, he may be present, but I always pray that the Lord will bind him, that he will keep him at bay, that he'll tell him to get hints. And we know that uh, he does what he's told. He does. He only does what he does by permission. If the Lord doesn't give him permission, he can't do it. But he's still there, and he's around every corner. He was. He's lurking. He's seeking whom he may devour. But as God's consecrated children with the Holy Spirit within, we know that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And so Samson had the same thing when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Then he had such power. By the Spirit's power, the child of God can prevail against the gates of hell. Jesus said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. But you know, there in Micah chapter 2, the 13th verse, it says that the breaker, who is obviously the Lord Jesus Christ, the breaker has come up before them. And what has he done? He's broken the brass gates. He's unhinged them, if you will. He's done what Samson did here to the gates of Gaza. He's, he's exploded those gates. He's taken them on his shoulders. But yet, at the same time, it says they have broken up and passed through the gate. Who are they? The sheep. Us. So he's broken the gates. It's by his power, by his initial thrust that it's done. But then he includes us in it. We break these gates, these brass gates too. And like Samson, he carried them away. Carried them away all the way to the hill of Hebron. So we too can do what Samson did in the spiritual sense by the power of the Spirit. And by his power, we know that as he was able to take a jawbone of an ass and slay a thousand Philistines. Joshua 23.10 says, One of us with the power of God can chase a thousand, and two can put ten thousand to flight. That is the power that we have at our disposal, if you will. That's the power we have access to through consecration, proper diet of the Word of God and consecration in prayer and separation unto righteousness and trusting in the Lord our God, we can do what Samson did. We can chase a thousand, one man. So let us not, however, and we see the warning loud and clear here in the text for this as well, let us not, like Samson, having such power at his call, foolishly toy, toy with danger and grieve the Holy Spirit and thereby forfeit the secret strength that we have against the enemy. And believe me, we're able to do that. We're capable of doing that just the same as, as Samson did. Notice how it happened. Notice the danger that the consecrated face. He was a Nazarite, consecrated unto the Lord. He had done great things as the Spirit of God came upon him. And here we find him being seduced into temptation, being allured into temptation, just like we can be allured by the world. I have an idea that all of us wish that we could say that we have not fallen for Satan's devices even after we've been burned. S Samson here was sucked into this temptation three times. All three times it was made evident what the Philistines intended to do to him if he was deprived of his strength. And yet he was drawn into this temptation the third time and that was the fatal time. That's when that she really learned the secret of his heart and his strength was taken away from him. Of course, we know that 
this is just symbolic. This is uh, setting forth in a picture that we can't fully explain only to know what it indicates. That we have a sec secret, secret strength that we can lose. We can lose it to temptation and we can lose it to sin. And I say again, I'm sure that we wish that we were able to say that Satan has never lured us with the same device twice. Yeah, yes. But we hopefully learn from that, just like we learn from Samson's fatal mistake here. But Satan has many razors with which to remove our secret strength and render us weak. And he finds a lot of those razors in our own cabinet. Pride, for example, how Delilah must have stroked his pride. Self-sufficiency. Listen to what he says in verse 20. She said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. He awoke out of sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord had departed from him. Did he not know that it was in the strength of the Lord that he was able to do that and not his own? Did he not know it was when the Spirit of God came upon him? Surely he had to know that. And yet here, he acts as though it was all in his power. I did it before, I'll do it again. I broke the seven green withs, I broke the new ropes, I, I slew a lion, I slew a thousand Philistines with a crude instrument. I've done all these things and I'll do it again. That's what he, his self-confidence. And that kind of self-confidence and pride is sure to go before a fall. John 15:5 is a verse that I'm reminded of very often. Anytime I'm calling upon the Lord to help me, I'm reminded without him I can do nothing. And in the sense, the spiritual sense in getting the gospel out and being victorious in this warfare, we can't do a single thing. We can't bear fruit unto God without the Holy Spirit, and that's the very context of that verse. You know, a lot of religious activity is done by men who may have at one time had power with God or power of the power of God on them, at least it appeared they had. We can see it happen in others. They lose their power with God, and we need that power, and we dare not jeopardize it. We need more and more of it. Let us not jeopardize it by being lured into temptation, but rather just the opposite. Seek more of his word and more prayer and more holiness that we might have more power with God. There's a danger of spiritual slumber. We see here how that he acted as he lay upon her knees. And, of course, here, the, the lesson is obvious. Knowing the time, that it's high time for us to wake out of sleep, that we are to cast off the works of darkness and be clothed with the armor of light. We cannot slumber. Satan will certainly move in when we are in a state of spiritual slumber. There's a state of self-consciousness, a state of self-confidence. This is a very sharp, ready razor that Satan finds available too often. Samson had but one purpose. He was to deliver out of the hands of the Philistines his people. He was to begin to deliver as what was said at the beginning. You read that and you wonder, well, why does God say that he's going to begin? The angel told his mother, he's going to begin to deliver. I think we see why it's worded that way. He might have completely delivered them had he not fallen into temptation. What an, I say again, what a, what a riddle he is. But his state of self-confidence, you know, he needed to be reminded 
as we need to be reminded like Esther, we need some Mordecai to come and to shake us and to remind us of what our purpose is here in this world. That God has put us here for this particular time. We have a job to do. And it's not to be lulled to sleep by the world. It's not to be lured into temptation and lose our power with God. It's to carry on this battle and to see it won. I notice very quickly the, uh, the worst disgrace that a Christian can, can suffer in verse 21. They put out his eyes to be blind, no spiritual discernment. Powerless, no strength to break the shackles that they had him in. Always before, he could just break them. Not this time. To become enslaved on the world's treadmill. That's what he was doing. You've seen these. He was grinding in their mill. He was like the oxen that turned the treadmill. Around and around and around. The great Samson that had slain so many Philistines. Look at him now. And they're making sport of him. The children are. He's an object of ridicule. That is what the worst disgrace for a Christian can be in this life if he's truly a Christian. To be deprived of spiritual discernment. To have his strength spiritual strength taken from him to be on the world's treadmill kind of doing their thing instead of the Lord's thing and become the object of ridicule. God was faithful to Samson even in his death. We know that you know the story. He slew more in his death than he did in his life because as they took him into this great uh, arena where all the people were packed in and the lords of the Philistines were all there and a servant led him in because he was blind. I guess they brought him there to further mock him. But of course he had the servant to bring him to the pillars and let him feel of the pillars that held the whole thing up. And he once more prayed to God. His hair had begun to grow again and he prayed to God one last time. May the Spirit of God come upon me. And he did. And he pulled the house down, destroyed thousands and thousands of Philistines in his death. But had he not fallen into temptation, he could have had the same victory and would have had no need of self-destruction in having it. Who can tell what a long life of service he may have forfeited? As I said, he only began to deliver the people out of the hand of the Philistines. Perhaps had he not fallen into sin and lost his power, he could have completely delivered them out of the hands of the Philistines. So let us uh, not be satisfied with accomplishing less than it is possible for us to accomplish. And the only way we can do that is to remain consecrated unto the Lord, stay in his word and prayer, seek his face, walk in holiness, and call upon him in our time of need when we're up against the enemy. Trust him to provide us with the power that we need to win. And when we're taking the gospel to the lost, Trust him to empower that gospel in us and the delivery of it to great victory. Because we don't just want Christ was given the heathen for his inheritance to do with what he would. He will, many of them are going to be destroyed, but many of them are going to be saved. They're his by election. And we have the privilege of taking the gospel to all the world and have God to call out his chosen ones through us. I, I want that kind of power, and I think you do too. And let us not um, 
forfeit that power.